Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you all for showing up to this talk. I'm very excited about it to have um, our two people from our group in Massachusetts, Emily Carroll and Michelle Friedman Yakubian. Um, so as a quick introduction, um, Michelle Friedman Yakubian is a clinical psychologist and assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, so she is the co-founder and director of research and development at the Skeeter Clinic in Boston, which works with uh, young people at clinical high risk to develop a, a psychosis. And then uh, Emily Carroll is um, the clinic director of the STAR program at McLean Hospital. Uh, so she is a member of the laboratory and uh, the STAR Center uh, works with young people at clinical high risk to develop psychosis as well. So thank you both for agreeing to present with us today. Um, they'll be talking about working with families. Um, so with that, I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you so much, Kelsey, and, and for everyone else for joining us today. I'm just gonna share my screen to start the slides. All right, can you all see the, the screen right here? Great. So we are really thrilled to be here to be talking to you all about engaging families as helpful members of the treatment team, uh, especially for youth experiencing early psychosis. So we're talking about, you know, the full spectrum of emerging psychosis symptoms. So clinical high risk all the way up to first episode psychosis as well. Um, and we really hope this can be a discussion between all of us since we have so many talented people on this call here. And so what we'll be doing is, let's see. Make sure I can move through the slides. Here we go. So we'll get to that soon, but we have a few things to go over before jumping into the conversation with you all. Hi, everyone. This is Courtney Spitzer, the project coordinator for our Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative of the MHTTC. Um, if you already, if you haven't already done so, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. And I just want to review a few housekeeping items before we begin. Participant microphones have been muted at entry, and you'll be able to unmute them during the discussion portion. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the topic, uh, feel free to use the chat box. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on the MHTTC website. To reach us after the webinar, you can email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide provides a description of our disclaimers for MHTTC. And next slide, please. The MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. That language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of our diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences. Healing-centered, trauma-responsive, inviting to individuals participating in their own journeys, person first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, consistent with our actions, policies, and products. With that, it is my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Carroll for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Courtney. So what we're hoping to do together is talk about ways of engaging families. Um, so really focusing on those early steps of how do you get families involved in treatment? How do you maintain that engagement um, and the challenges that can come up in doing that? Um, so in a little bit, we're going to be um, using an audience participation um, tool called menti.com. So you could get that set up right now if you'd like. Um, the way to do that is either on your um, computer here or on your phone as well. You can go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com, and then put in this code, which we can also put in the chat as well. And it's going to be on the next couple of slides, um, so, you don't, so you won't lose that code. So what we're hoping to do together is briefly talk about the challenges related to involving and engaging family members and loved ones. And we're using that term um, broadly. And so anyone who's in the caretaking role or an important, important part of um, a young adult who's experiencing early psychosis. 
Um, we want to hear from you as well about the benefits and challenges. So we are going to use menti.com for that, or you're also welcome to put anything in the chat. Then we're going to go through some case examples, um, discuss those challenges, hear from you all about what you might have done in these situations, us providing suggestions about that, and then we'll go through some more specific resources and tips. So we really want to hear from you with this first slide of what do you all view as the benefits of involving families in treatment for early psychosis? So if you go to this menti.com and put in this code, and I'm going to switch over to that slide right now. So this is a word bubble. So the more and more um, responses that we get, you'll see them pop up and the um, most common, res uh, more responses will be larger and um, the one or two responses will be smaller. So as you see something grow, you'll see that more people are putting that in. So right now we're seeing in terms of the most popular benefits, collaboration, support, consistency. This is excellent. Thank you all for, for submitting your answers. Lots of different things we're seeing here. So better outcomes, repairing relationships, learning coping skills, family support, encouragement, treatment adherence, strong support network, Moving quickly, this is excellent. Healthy communication, gathering information, more sustained recovery, accountability, getting a medical history, outcomes, education, insight of that, better outcomes, resources, accountability, hope, yes, vulnerable, validation, improvements. Support and collaboration seem to still be the front runners. We'll give us a few more seconds. Thank you all for participating in this. So this seems like it's uh, no longer moving. So it seems like this is what we have so far. So in support and collaboration really are the, the most common things that people are observing in terms of benefits. And I think you all could do this introduction for me because all of these things that we um, are talking about in terms of benefits that we see of involving families in treatment or is everything that you just mentioned right here. So I'll switch over to our slides and we'll come back to the next mentee question in a moment. So, you know, this is just a summary really of everything that you all just said. So, you know, research has really shown that um, engaging families in treatment can lead to better outcomes. So examples of those outcomes were the um, preventing future, future hospitalizations, targeting symptoms directly, um, empowering and engaging um, the young adult or client. Um, increased engagement is also seen to be really related to family engagement as well. So um, there's studies that show that especially after hospitalization, the more uh, family members or social supports are engaged, the more likely clients are to follow up with their appointments and attend their appointments and then maintaining again engagement overall. And then another thing that is observed is there can be less overall family distress and burden when the family members are engaging in treatment. And I, I think this is important to stress because I think often we hear that from our clients that they don't want to cause more burden and stress to their family, so they don't want them to engage. And so this can be a nice place of um, um, psychoeducation and discussion around this point of how might engaging family and supports lead to less distress and burden overall, which can then lead to um, more positive outcomes for the young adult as well. So because of all of these benefits that have been observed and all the benefits that you all just put in the word bubble, you know, family Engagement is a core component of coordinated specialty care. Um, it's been shown um, in the Navigate um, studies and is a big part of the Navigate model. And so, you know, just 
you know, even with it being so important, there's a lot of challenges that come up. And so that's what we really want to talk about today. And that's, that will be our next mentee slide of hearing from you. What are the challenges that come up in trying to engage families in early psychosis treatment? And think about both the challenges from the perspective of in-person, but also this hybrid virtual, virtual era that we're in right now, the different challenges that might come up there. So we'll switch over to the next mentee slide here. All right, so the benefits, let's just go to the next one. So what are the challenges that come up when trying to engage families in early psychosis treatment? Scheduling, yes. You can see it's huge. It is a very big, big challenge. Things can be chaotic, absolutely. Mm, trust, fear, acceptance. I imagine acceptance on both ends, the client and the family. Stigma, yeah, burnout more straight stress, lack of sense of importance, mm -hmm. not interested, yeah. Work schedules, beliefs about therapy, mistrust, yeah. Disbelief, time, doesn't care, yeah. bad previous experiences, reluctance of the client, conflicts, unpredictability, doesn't like medications, yep, specific symptoms like paranoia, availability, mm, family feels blame, inadequate access, yep, inequitable access, yes, fear, A lot of responses. This is fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Shame, lack of knowledge, beliefs about illness, resistance from both sides. Seems like scheduling de denial, stigma, mistrust, culture, fear. These are the big ones. Burnout. Yeah. Imagine burnout both from the um, treatment team side, but also the family side as well. Unresolved emotions, overwhelmed family systems, their own mental health. Great. So we see it's um, has slowed down. So it seems like still um, denial, scheduling, stigma, trust, burnout, culture, fear, lack of understanding are the the big ones here. And that's that's what we you know we'll be talking about in these next couple of slides as well. So thank you all. And if anyone has more to say about this, feel free to, feel free to put it in the chat as well. Okay. All right, I'm gonna switch back over to our slides so, and be able to transition into us talking more now that we you know, have acknowledged that this, this is a very important piece of the work that we do and there's huge challenges in doing it. How do we manage these challenges um, and stick with it so that we can help our clients and our families get the most benefits as possible? So I'm gonna stop sharing my slides right now and switch it over. You're on mute, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, Emily, thanks for that introduction and everybody for taking part in the mentee surveys. I think those were super interesting. So our next part of our plan for today was to start sparking some discussions around some of the common challenges that show up. And we've put together three case examples that are really composite, de-identified people that Emily and I have seen or um, worked with in various clinics and wanted to use these case discussions or case examples as a spark for discussion. So I'm gonna share the first one and really hoping that folks will, um, will participate in kind of sharing their thoughts either by uh, speaking up uh, or um, putting some thoughts into the chat and I can see bulk if we need to. So here's the first one. Um, this is, uh, and then after we go through the case discussions, I have a few slides just kind of sharing some general ideas, resources, and we'll uh, send out the slides 
afterwards. So no one has to worry about, um, you know, writing everything down or taking screenshots. We'll be able to send those to the group as well. So Yusuf is an 18 year old cis male. He lives with his parents and two younger brothers in Boston. His parents are immigrants from Sudan, but he and his brothers were born in the US. He was referred to the clinic by his school counselor as he was observed to be, after he was observed to be talking to himself and acting strangely, collecting pieces of trash in his locker, wearing a hood and two hats. Yusuf disclosed to the school counselor that he hears the devil talking to him, sometimes worries that kids in the neighborhood are trying to steal his thoughts. He wears the hood and hats to protect himself. He has also started to carry a pocket knife for protection. Yusuf and his parents initially indicated interest in treatment. However, Yusuf attended only one out of every three scheduled sessions. And his parents did not attend any scheduled, scheduled sessions after the intake. The family therapist would periodically reach Yusuf's dad on the phone and schedule an appointment, but they would not be reachable either by phone or Zoom at the time of the appointment. During one of the sessions, Yusuf told his counselor that his parents told him that the medications he is prescribed might be addictive and he should stop taking them. So I'm wondering, I'm gonna maybe stop share for a second so I can see everybody. And I'm wondering if, you know, if there's anything about this that sounds familiar to people. Um, and if so, if anyone would be willing to share some thoughts either about similar challenges that showed up or why don't we sort of start with that and I'm also interested in in ways that people have tried to to work with with some of these challenges to engage with families like Yusuf's. See, we have a little bit of a shy. Yeah, so thanks, Heather. Missed appointments, parent, parents discouraging medication, being suspicious, worried about it. I'll jump in with a few comments. Um, so I'm, a, I'm Allison Sargon. I'm a psychiatrist at a first episode psychosis program in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, we have a fairly large uh, Nepali and Bhutanese uh, refugee population here in central Pennsylvania. Um, and so that's probably sort of like the closest um, to this case in terms of a culture that um, might think about mental illness very differently from um, Western culture. Um, and so I think it's really interesting in those cases that I've seen to get an understanding, if you're able to get the family or the, or the patient in to get an understanding of what their explanation for the symptoms or the illness is, because um, it's often very different um, than how we think about it um, as a, you know, sort of more of a biological illness. Um, so I, we did have one um, Nepali American uh, young male um, whose parents believed that his psychotic symptoms were due to um, evil spirits and um, we were able to talk about that in um, some of the sessions. I don't believe that in some of my med management sessions, I don't believe they ever attended any um, family therapy sessions. Um, and the family was very set on doing a puja, a prayer ceremony where they brought a priest home um, to help uh, cleanse the, the young adult of, uh, of the spirits. And, and so we really tried to to balance um, and respect their beliefs uh, um, as well as trying to get them to see that the medication and the other treatment components could be a complement to that, that they could both to go together. But it was it was definitely a, a difficult balance. Thank you, Allison, for sharing that. I think that's really there were some really important elements in what you said. It sounds like a really big piece of that was really, you know, it wasn't just about your team educating the family but it was also about your team becoming educated about the family's culture and what's important to them. And it was important for that to be both ways in order for there to be an effective solution where you're all understanding each other. And I think that's a really nice example from that way. I also appreciate Shay and Shanna also wrote in 
some things in the chat. Um, Shay wrote, I think in this case, educating the parents as well as the youth about their diagnosis as well as the outcome and the concerns about not having the family treatment and not having medication. Um, and Shanna wrote disagreement about understanding of symptoms when they have religious or spiritual underpinnings. And again, I really agree with that. I think a really big piece has to be understanding and kind of working on understanding um, that piece. Curious if anyone else has some comments, thoughts around, I think one of the things that was kind of inherent in this case was, was scheduling issues and also establishing with, with the parents and the team, like I think the family therapist really had a thought of like, they don't really know who I am. They don't really understand why they're supposed to meet with me. Um, any thoughts about that and things that have been effective or just things that folks have tried for, you know, helping to really integrate a family therapist into a team like this. I think I see someone's lips moving. Is Marsha, are you speaking, but maybe you're muted? So sorry. Yes, I am trying to um, explain how I could explain it to um, the ladies. Um, I'm a family peer support specialist in Akron. And the so I work with um, the therapists that work with um, psychosis, you know, early psychosis um, first episodes. And it's very hard for me to um, engage with parents because first they don't understand what you know, first episode psychosis is. And then second, they just don't want to be bothered. They want to have a quick fix and be done. And so we try to explain to them, it's not a quick fix. You know, your, your child's not going to be well like tomorrow. And I'm here to support you as the parent, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to um, try to give you advice. I'm going to try to give you resources that you could use um, to help you understand what's going on. So it's it's definitely a challenge yeah. with us and the parents because we're the ones that see the parents most days, yeah. and then the therapists see their child. And then to come together with the therapist and talk, you know, when I go and talk to the therapist, you know, I try to tell them, okay, this is what the parent is, you know, understanding. And is this right? Can we sit down with the parent? And sometimes we all just sit down with the parent both and they do their psychoeducation with the parent. And that seems to help. Thank you, Marsha. I think yeah. you said some really important things about patients being a really important part of both the engagement process with families and also trying to share that with them because of course they want a, a, quick, a quick fix and of course they want their, their person to get better and to benefit from medications and treatment right away. Kathy um, Adams also wrote something and I think that's really important. Kathy, do you wanna turn on your mic and share that directly or should I read that? Sure, sure, I'm happy to share it. I think the comments that uh, Dr. Swigert made about culture and other people made about religious and spiritual explanations and how uh, mental health experience is attributed. But I also think a big thing that we've seen for families um, from other uh, countries is is stigma and that the one person's mental health engagement gets assigned to the family as a whole and and people worry about what that means in their own communities um, and in communities at large and in their kind of like you know space in in America um, and I think it can be really a barrier and while scheduling is kind of mentioned and you guys know kind of even though this is kind of a fictionalized conglomeration of families, 
or, or multiple families. I feel like these two, these cultural things feel like the biggest barriers with this family to me. So just thought I would share that. Kathy, you are right on the nose. Um, just to kind of um, share a few things that, that we sort of wound up doing on our team, you know, one piece um, that we learned, you know, later on, I mean, some of the patients that was involved, we kind of changed our model rather than having the family therapist make appointments and expect them to show up for appointments. We kind of changed the model where the family therapist just called the family, you know, every day they were in, you know, so about three, two or three times a week, they would just call the family, see if I could catch them on the phone, just to check in, start to get to know them. And rather than when they caught them trying to make, you know, use that time to make an appointment, they would use that time to say, how's it going? You know, I'm, I really want to help communicate with Yusuf's doctor and the team about, you know, how he's doing, like, how's the medication going? How are things, these things going? And, and, you know, it wasn't like magic overnight. Most of the time, the therapist just left a message and didn't connect, but just kind of persistently and would get little bits of information in those phone calls. And Another thing that was helpful in this case was transitioning to some in-person appointments and working with a provider that the family and, and use have already had some trust in. So there was a school counselor they actually did trust. And that person attended some of these in-person appointments. And they really found the in-person appointments helped to kind of solidify, here's everyone on the team and this is what they do and allow them to get to know each other and have a little bit more connection and I'd say about six to eight months later, um, the dad started sharing with the family therapist a little bit about his culture and the stigma that related to getting mental health treatment and the ways in which that can impact the entire, how the entire family is seen um, to have someone in the family who's on medication and getting uh, mental health treatment. So, it really, I, you know, I think very similar to what you bring up. Also appreciate um, some of the other uh, things that folks, uh, Victoria Hasler wrote in about the multifamily group and how that can be helpful. Um, Kyle, I appreciate your comment about, you know, that it's, it's tough on therapists if you don't have a whole lot of training and support on how to do this work. I think that's part of what, you know, even offering this session is about and that's only going to be a little piece but I will be we will be sharing some resources that hopefully can help to expand and Rox I appreciate the concern about the knife um, that you have and, and that that really did kind of uh, up the ante for the team um, you know again some of this is made up but the sort of person I'm thinking about that there were some legitimate safety concerns that had to be shared with the family. And a lot of that wound up getting shared in these in-person meetings from the psychiatrist directly, because at first, the, you know, they just really weren't understanding the family clinician's role. And so it was hard for them to provide, but the, um, the psychiatrist did have some pretty um, pointed conversations sharing with the family her concerns about his safety and that the experiences and symptoms he was having made him feel unsafe and made him feel like he needed to carry a knife. And this is a, you know, this is a, a young boy, um, you know, who, you know, that could easily be misunderstood in uh, sort of walking around Boston with a knife. Um, so a person of color who, you know, could, you know, wind up in trouble in a lot of different ways. And so there was a lot of concern both about just, you know, his safety of carrying a knife around, but also his safety of being sort of victimized, you know, either by peers or even police in that situation. Thank you all. I'm going to share my screen again and move on to our second case. Emily, do you want to read this one? Sure. So the second case, I think a lot of the things that were shared in the chat and already discussed would very much apply. So for this case, Sammy is a 24 year old Caucasian woman who recently moved back home to live with her parents after being let go from her job. 
Her parents have become increasingly concerned that Samley hardly leaves the house, seems distracted, and has difficulty multitasking. Their concern increased after Sammy got upset when her mom asked her to take out the trash, saying, I just can't right now with everything. I'm just so confused all the time. It's impossible to focus and to know what's really going on. At the clinic intake, Sammy was reluctant to talk about her experiences and the team worked closely with their parents to get collateral information. After a few weeks, Sammy opened up to her clinical team and shared more details about hearing different voices seeing shadowy figures, and increasing concern that she is in danger. She then immediately withdrew her consent to allow her team to talk with her parents, saying, I don't want to scare or worry them. She shared feelings like a failure and that she doesn't want them to be monitoring or judging her on what she can or can't do. So we can turn it back over and talk as a group together. Love to hear, does this sound familiar? Have people navigated similar instances um, or ideas come up for them in, term, in terms of how you would navigate the situation? Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Regina, I'm a case manager from North Range Behavioral Health. Um, so we have a lot of clients who, you know, don't wanna share their experiences with their parents out of, you know, fear, shame, guilt, and it's really common. Um, we typically get an ROI, you know, just for emergency contacts, and that's kind of how we can swing it. Um, but just finding, you know, different supports for them. Um, I think especially at the age of 24, it's kind of like, ooh, am I an adult? You know, I can't expect my, my parents to look after me, you know, especially if I'm experiencing these symptoms. Um, so it definitely resonates, you know, with our team for sure. Thank you so much, Regina so much about what you said, you know, resonates with me with my own work as well, right? This, you know, challenge of the developmental period of someone being 24 years old um, and wanting to be able to be independent and also the fear and guilt that comes up there as well. Um, so I also heard you say getting a release right away. Um, that's something that Michelle and I were talking about as we were preparing for this case around how um, getting a release early, especially on safety concerns and talking about what that actually means with the client um, is important as well. Are there things that people are thinking about or strategies that they've used to work with someone when they um, ask to either take back a release that they've signed or have you know, suddenly decided that they don't want the team to be talking with their family anymore? Patience, yes. Mm -hmm. I know um, one thing that we have done um, is we will allow that we will tell the family that um, while we cannot share information, we can receive all the information that you can give us. Um, and at least that way, the family is able to feel like they have an avenue to be able to share their concerns. Um, and then we can respond in a lot of ways where we're able to say, so if I, you know, in, in my previous, you know, work with other clients and things, this is something that, you know, you can do. And that way you can help address things and not make it specific towards the client. You're kind of walking like a very thin line, but, um, you know, if you're not disclosing direct information about the client, you can still help support the family and let them know, um, yeah, that they, this is what we would do with a, you know, with a client and hopefully help help support them. Absolutely, Kelly. So many important things about what you just said. So, you know, informing the parents around, you know, what they can still do and right, always encouraging them to share whatever information we can always receive information, even if your loved one doesn't want us to be talking to you. And then I really like what you said about still being able to provide support for them by talking generally about experiences, you know, and, and um, being able to provide them some more information, skills and supports to use that would generalized to their own loved one, but isn't necessarily directly specific about things that their loved one said or that you're working on with them. So yes, I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, we have a client that we, we waited a long time on getting mom involved and that was my patient's comment. What we have kind of negotiated with her is to never use the diagnosis, just mm -hmm. talk about symptoms. And she's comfortable with that with her because her, she lives with her mom. She is a young adult, she lives with her mom. 
and uh, and she's comfortable with that because mom sees them, but never to use the diagnosis in front of mom. So mm-hmm. it's an interesting balance of getting through there. And uh, I'm a family advocate, but uh, one of the psychiatrists I worked with said, fine, we don't care if we use the diagnosis. We'll just, we're trying to just help mom help her and them living together. So it really works well. Absolutely. So really talking about what does the client feel comfortable in sharing um, and why, you know, why is it useful, you know, helping give them um, some more background and information around how is sharing certain specific information with the people that they're living with and interacting with can make their lives easier and help them support them, but letting them choose, letting them use the language that they feel most comfortable with. We have a number of things in the chat as well that I wanted to to highlight. Um, Offering to have them participate in a conversation um, by, would allow them, yes. So thinking about ways of empowering them, you know, if they are uncomfortable with the clinician sharing the information, you know, could you have a meeting together and have them share, you know, talk and share the information in that way so that they feel like they have more control and to increase that level of trust. Yeah. From Ian, we have, um, that's a good way to get collateral inflammation could hurt your relationship with the client about talking behind their back. So I think, you know, an important thing to think about in maintaining that, you know, therapeutic relationship is, you know, sharing that with the client as well, you know, saying that, you know, as a provider, um, these are my roles in terms of keeping you safe, but also here are the ground rules in terms of confidentiality. I can't share your information, but I can always receive that information. Um, And, you know, I will, be transparent and use my clinical judgment and share that with you when I think that's useful. But then also sharing with the parent as well that anything that they share with you is fair game to be providing to the client that you're working with as well. Because I think um, there can be cases that come up where the, you know, a loved one gets in touch with you and says, you know, don't share that with, with the client. And, and that can lead to tr- tricky situations. So I think, you know, emphasizing upfront in the beginning that, you know, what you share with me uh, is, is I will use if I think it will be useful um, to share with the client that I'm working on, yeah. working with. Okay. Um, so from Lisa, if the relationship is there, really taking the time to explore the concerns, the pros and cons of having family involvement and their, um, um, what can be implemented, letting them know that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing scenario. Yes, Lisa. Um, so spending that time, if, especially if there isn't any acute needs that you're seeing in that moment of, you know, there, there can, you can let this relationship evolve over time. And so exploring, you know, with the client around what their hesitations are, uh, working on um, really learning that so you can use that information to say, okay, well, here's what I'm hearing. I'm concerned about these other needs of yours not being met. How might we go about thinking about um, engaging your family to make sure that your needs are being met? And then at the same time, working with the family in terms of, um, I saw early in the chat talking about um, family groups, seeing what other supports might be helpful for them so that they can make sure they're getting their needs met in terms of learning more information, connecting with other family members or other providers. And, you know, this is a combination of cases, but I think that um, taking the time to learn about what their reservations are is the thing that comes up a lot and actually leads to um, them, you know, giving out more permission. And so letting them feel like they're in control, they're feeling heard um, and understanding, you know, what is it that they're concerned about and um, is also learning about the family system as well, I think can really inform those conversations too. Anything else that people want to add to this conversation or things that they've tried, you've tried and it didn't go, it didn't work out as well as you hoped or things that um, you have learned from others that you really want to think about for future cases? One of the things I was thinking about with this case, Emily, is um, how stigma is like, you know, maybe really inherent to this idea that now I've told you about these voices you can't talk to my parents. If they found out about it, they wouldn't be able to handle it. So I need to protect everyone from knowing I hear voices. And as Sammy learns a little bit more about her voices and understands, you know, 
that these are experiences that are more common than people realize that these are experiences that um you know can you know treatment can really help to have those you know cause less trouble for her in her life the more likely maybe she'll be willing to let her parents know about it and have the clinicians help in talking with their parents about it so that they don't have that initial fear reaction that so many people tend to have when they don't really understand psychosis or understand voices very well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And like what I like about what you're saying, Michelle, is also thinking about um, choosing where to start in terms of disclosing that information of, um, I think the conversation that we had about the previous case of, you know, what are things that they want to start with and and that feels most comfortable. Um, so maybe not focusing on the symptoms, but focusing on these things are hard for me to do right now. Um, how can we work together so that I can be supported in doing these things? And then eventually when more, more comfort, more conversations, um, identifying the different self stigma that's coming up, perceived stigma from the family, um, going into more details about why that's hard, but really focusing on um, the behaviors can be a way to increase that comfort. Well, feel free to put more in the chat and we'll, we'll go on to our next case. This is fantastic discussion. Thank you, everyone. So here's case number three. So oops, I'm covering it up. So Seb is a 14 year old trans male living with a single mom. Uh, they've always been very close and Seb considers his mom to be his closest friend. Seb told his mom last year that he was hearing voices that distracted him while he was at school. He began refusing to attend school when he also started to experience, quote, shameful thoughts and images. He would not tell his mom what these were specifically, but he noted that the shameful thoughts were triggered when he saw younger children playing. He began avoiding the school playground. After a few weeks, he began feeling triggered by seeing any children younger than 10. Eventually, he required that mom help him avoid even seeing pictures of children in magazines, computer, or TV. Mom noted feeling overwhelmed by the need to try to keep Seb safe from all these triggers. She took family leave from work in order to be more available to help Seb avoid triggers. She called the clinic often, making suggestions to the clinical team about how to better serve Seb. For example, she asked, them to remove any magazines with pictures of children from the waiting room. She also asked if Seb could start working with a different therapist because Seb appeared more upset after a recent session. Curious if anyone has this sort of uh, sounds familiar to anybody or has any thoughts about this one. We have a mom who's making lots of sacrifices, who's trying to protect her child from any discomfort, um, kind of making lots of requests from the treatment team. I'll go ahead and share. We've had a client with a mom um, similar in the sense of like really being involved heavily in the treatment and trying to guide treatment. Um, and we basically just had a conversation with her and said, you know, at the end of the day, what do you want for your child? And she says, well, I want him to be an independent adult. And so we, we worked with that kind of motivational interview and say, okay, well, let's teach him how to manage his care um, and collaborate in helping him to have a voice and speaking up for himself instead of having her do it for him. Thanks for sharing that, Heather. That sounds really important, really trying to understand and ally with mom around her goal and establishing that the treatment team's goal and her goal were the same and that you really wanna to help to make that goal happen. And that some of the things that she's doing that were really well-meaning you know, may inadvertently be actually undermining sort of what she was really hoping um, and it sounds like help to develop some trust um, that allowed 
him to start taking over more of his, his treatment as well. Uh, I see Regina wrote, I think that's such a difficult situation. It doesn't sound like they're getting to the root of the issues with Seb. Regina, I wonder if you might be willing to say a little more. Yeah, definitely. So it sounds like it's a lot of avoidance and kind of just, you know, keeping those triggers, you know, away. But why? And I know, you know, why is such a difficult question sometimes, but just kind of figuring out mm -hmm. how can we make you more comfortable because you can't ignore these things all the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, and kind of working towards that. And also for everyone's safety, I would just definitely be curious, like, why the specific population? Like, why are you avoiding this? And especially if they're more shameful thoughts and empowering Seb to discuss those with a safe person. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Regina. I definitely agree. I'll, I'll sort of talk a little bit more about what we've kind of done in situations like that in a minute. Sierra wrote, I understand that mom wants her son um, said, but if he's seeing a therapist, she has to allow that she wants to help her son. Um, if he's seeing a therapist, she has to allow them to help him and not overstep boundaries. She also has to want to learn about what's going on and why this is going on as well. Yeah, I agree. I'll, yeah, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to hop in at that. I think it's, um, it's your mom's intentions are good, as you've said. Um, in my role as a family advocate, this is a perfect time to use the advocate to jump in with the family in the C CSC model. Um, you know, to validate, most of this comes from fear. I've been there. I am the mother of a young adult with severe mental illness. Um, believe me, if it could be fixed by switching a clinician, I've tried it. So, or at least I thought that would fix it, right? Um, so she's, she needs to be validated. She needs to have explanations. She needs psychoeducation and she needs to learn to care and love this new version of Seb and, um, and have the skills and tools to do it. She has the best of intentions. She's just, you know, probably confused and, and mostly scared. So I think you go all the way back and, you know, bring in someone like me that's been scared and unknowing and you plant that person in there and, um, and get it going on that end and kind of separate the two before bringing them back together. Thanks so much, Rox. I really appreciate you sharing all of that. I think there's so many important components. One, just really validating. I think sometimes, um, sometimes teens can get frustrated with a parent that's kind of making a lot of demands and I've heard this happen. Like teens can kind of say like, oh, no wonder he's stressed out because look at that, you know, and it's not helpful. I think we all have to remember, I, I sort of write this later on. We need to remember that families are doing the best they can, you know, and that we cannot make assumptions about what a person is like in all areas of their life based on this incredibly stressful situation that they're trying to navigate for their kid and with their kid. Um, the other thing you said, I think, Rox, it's so important is really understanding her perspective and sharing. And that sometimes, um, you know, a family advocate can um, connect and partner in a way that, you know, no one else on the team can, and that they can sort of say, "I've been there," and I, I, I sort of, um, you know, that sort of sharing that experience, I think, is so important around just feeling empathy and connection and hope. Um, for things kind of getting better as well. In this case, um, and I also appreciate some of the comments around what's really going on. And, you know, and I think in this case, it was, you know, I think it was incredibly important to develop a relationship with mom, to understand her perspective, to validate her perspective, to make sure that she felt like we knew you know, what her intentions were and how much she cared and to kind of recognize that there's nothing she wouldn't do to make things better for her kid. You know, that all of these things were ways that she was showing caring and connection and dedication to helping. And then, you know, we wound up also needing to provide a little bit of psychoeducation around anxiety. Um, this is a kid who not only was experiencing psychotic symptoms, 
had a pretty significant anxiety disorder. You know, these images and the need to avoid the triggers actually started to sound a lot more like OCD to us. And so part of the treatment was also providing education around the model of treatment for anxiety disorders and how it's totally understandable that any caring parent in this situation was gonna to try to prevent situations that made Seb anxious and overwhelmed, but at the same time, kind of counterintuitively, you know, an anxiety disorder, when you kind of just start removing all the triggers, you actually kind of uh, strengthen it over time and, you know, kind of introducing to the idea of kind of the exposure and response prevention you know, and the idea of, of how sort of accommodations can actually feed in and kind of strengthen that response and that, you know, kind of needing to avoid all things that related to children in their life was not a workable situation long term. And that actually helping Seb start to discover that he was stronger than he thought in being able to handle some of that anxiety some of the time in order to do the things that were meaningful to him. Um, we also provided a lot of sort of normalizations. A lot of times when, when kids are having these like terrible thoughts, they think it means they're a terrible person and sort of sharing some of the studies on kind of how normal it actually is to have some pretty terrible thoughts. Um, there's actually studies that have found that, you know, like in a group of nursing students that like, you know, having, you know, thoughts about killing people, whatever, like th those kinds of thoughts can show up and it doesn't mean you're gonna do it or that you're a bad person. It just means these are random things that show up in your mind. And that was really important as well. Um, and then also, you know, working with the psychiatrist around treating the anxiety disorder as well as treating um, the psychotic symptoms was important. Victoria, were you gonna say something as well? I saw you take your mic off. Thank you, Emily. I, I would really just build, I think, on what Michelle just shared um, to say it, or to echo the idea of um, validating mom's desire to help reduce anxiety in the short term and then wondering with her if it is sustainable over time when he's 25, is she going to be there to you know, shoo all the children away at the grocery store when he's going grocery shopping, right? And and if she can't, and if this isn't a sustainable so solution, is there something else we could consider um, to give her sort of the the option of, of seeing how short term it is um, and beginning to become comfortable with a different approach? I really appreciate that. I think that's really important. In giving this mom permission to also, you know, the importance of having her own life being something that's important for her caring for Seb as well. And then it's okay for her to, you know, for the goal to be for her to have some time for herself and not have all of her time and energy be focused all the time around, you know, trying to manage these triggers because it's not sustainable as well. Thank you. So I'm going to um, share my screen again and kind of just move into like a few, what a great discussion, um, kind of a few resources and tips, ideas. Um, please, everyone, feel free to keep jumping in with, you know, questions, thoughts, additional ideas. Um, these really just scratch the surface, I think. Um, but I will, uh, we'll, we'll make these slides available to everybody afterwards so that, um, you know, in case there's some information in here that's useful to follow up on, that you'll have access to it. So just, you know, kind of one piece, um, you know, there are a lot of different family programs, right? There's the Navigate family program, there's multifamily group, there's other sorts of uh, family interventions that have been developed and they all have evidence of um, being able to kind of reduce stress within families to help um, improve recovery as well. There's some basic ingredients that seem to be part of all of the effective family programs. Um, so these are some of uh, 
the thoughts about what's inherent to all of these um, family programs, family uh, treatment aspects of coordinated specialty care. So they're empathic, they're accepting, they're non-blaming, non-pathologizing. And here's where I've highlighted, families are stressed and they're doing the best they can. Um, really just wanna underscore that. Cause again, you know, even though we've kind of, you know, we often celebrate that we've evolved as a field from the days of the, you know, idea of the schizophrenogenic mother or the double bind theory, I'm still find myself in far too many clinical meetings where kind of family environment is blamed for what's going on with kids. And I really think it's important to understand the whole context. Unless we understand families and their perspective, how can we expect them to take our advice and to try things differently? It's so important. We need to understand their culture. We need to understand the, where they're coming from and the factors that are influencing them. Family uh, education programs need to be hopeful, enhancing development and coping of all family members. Again. You know, I think family um, engagement that's just focused on this is what you need to do for the kid where we're just ignoring the family members and, and their needs, um, again, um, doesn't provide as much as, as, as what uh, we need. Family uh, programs help families to communicate with the treatment team. That's incredibly important because families are an incredible resource for helping treatment teams to understand their kid, to understanding the, um, the culture within um, their family, of understanding what's you know, really going to be helpful in the long run for helping that person uh, to recover. We wanna increase social support and connection of not only the person who experiences psychosis, but of family as well. And often families are becoming very isolated by this experience of caring for a loved one. And they tend to have the basic elements of providing education, helping improve communication in families, and also providing a structure for talking about and coming up with solutions to family problems or goals. Here's an overview of the Navigate Family Program. And this is a, just a fantastic resource. I've included a link to the manuals as well. It's incredibly detailed. Um, you know, if you're somebody who's doing family work for the first time and want a step-by-step -step guide around some of the things to think about, um, this is an incredible free resource. And here's sort of just like an overview of the basic structure of the family work um, as outlined by Navigate, very similar to some of the other programs as well, but this one is a really nice accessible um, program that um, you can download today and have lots of important information. There's a lot of obstacles to family treatment. I think these got brought up in the mentee slide early on today. Um, and just, you know, want to kind of underscore that, you know, there are a lot of things that we think about. Um, Shay asked about where do I download the program? I have some links that I include at the end of these slides, but also if you don't, if you where to Google navigate psychosis manual family, you'll find it. A couple of things I wanted to underscore just in the uh, obstacles to family treatment. I think it's important for uh, family providers to, to be flexible. It's not a one size fits all approach. And if you're expecting families all to do the same thing, no matter their situation, you're gonna, you're, you know, you're gonna particularly underserve families that have all, you know, are, are you know, dealing with multiple stressors, coming from different cultures, um, developing um, different connections. Um, so flexibility is important. Um, and a system that allows for, let's just call the family three times a week and see if we get them on the phone versus, you know, you have to show up for a meeting and all your communication with the family is you've missed your meeting. Um, that's not gonna work and not be helpful. Um, the more that we can provide services um, where, uh, you know, the, the 
the family can participate in their own language, when the family can see people um, in systems that they can relate to and that they feel understood by, you know, that's an incredibly important part of providing good family work as well. Um, and I appreciate it. Someone earlier said, you know, if I haven't done this work before without training, it's really hard. And I think it is important to provide support and, you know, systems that do have kind of a dedicated family person with um, support in the team. It's incredibly important because you don't, you don't often sort of learn how to do this work. And for that reason, sometimes, you know, you know, clinicians will talk about sort of you know, finding the family, you know, certain families to be off-putting or wanting to avoid them. And I think it's really important when that's showing up to lean into that and, and understand better what's getting in the way and what the team can do to change their approach to be able to understand that family's perspective better. Uh, I have a little acronym here of some of the things that families need at the beginning of treatment. So H is for hope, having a hopeful attitude about the capacity for treatment to help, and the importance of family participation to increase the effectiveness of treatment. I really like to share that with families, that just by showing up and participating in meetings, they help us do our job. You know, they can help, even if it doesn't feel like it every time that they're making any difference, they really are. They need education, information about psychosis, the role of the family, providing resources. They need advocacy. Um, we need to help their relative learn effectively to communicate with the treatment team and advocate for needed resources. So we can really help by participating in things like school meetings and helping them to also uh, the R's get resources. So this can be information, support, Sometimes these are really practical resources like um, social security benefits and BMH and housing uh, as well. So I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but I've, I've kind of put together a list of some common family dilemmas and what can help that I'll share with folks. Um, this has come from just collections of things that have come up. So these are some of my, this is not a um, exhaustive list, nor is it, a, a, it's not an exhaustive list of dilemmas, nor is it a, an exhaustive list of solutions, but just a few ideas. So I'll kind of share these um, with folks uh, as well about some things that, and some of these are things that we wound up talking about in relation to some of these um, case examples. I have dilemmas with the carer that can show up. Also some dilemmas with clients. Um, one of the things I'll underscore from my experience, I think it's much easier to set up family treatment right at the beginning. And uh, especially when you set it up as this is just a regular part of what we do. Uh, early on in my training, when I was a postdoctoral fellow, I remember working with uh, a young person and we made the mistake of not including his family right away. And, you know, once I realized we wanted to talk to the family, he, he kept refusing. Um, and it wasn't until he had hospitalization and a, you know, pretty tough time that we eventually talked him into allowing his family to participate. And it was striking how much easier it was to be effective in treatment when the family started to participate. It made such a difference because you know, this kid was, he was quite paranoid and he didn't trust us. And so there's a lot we, you know, we just didn't understand about his life um, without the family participation. So I really do recommend that you, you know, you get those releases first thing and you present this, this is a part of our care and clarify, you know, part, you know, having your family participate in meetings is, does not mean that we are sharing details about your therapy with the family clinician. In fact, we will talk about what we will and won't share with them. But in our experience, when families participate in treatment, everybody gets more out of that experience. Here's some links. Um, and again, we'll, we'll share these 
uh, as well, but I have a link to the raise manuals. Um, there's a wonderful program through NAMI called Family to Family that I highly, highly recommend. Uh, I've worked with some families whose lives have really been changed by participating in that program and it's free. Um, Cedar uh, Family Information Sheet has a lot of um, resources as well that you can find. Uh, I also included a couple of other things um, that aren't psychosis specific. Uh, one is called the, co the Collaborative and Proactive Solutions Approach uh, or the Lives in the Balance uh, Walking Tour. So this is Ross Green um, who kind of has uh, an approach that has a lot of overlaps with the Navigate Family Program in terms of you know, learning sort of a structure for, um, for solving problems, identifying. But there's a video in this walking tour that I really like and I share with a lot of families. It's called Kids Do Well If They Can. And really what's inherent to this uh, is when you might have some parents that come in or relatives who are just so frustrated with their relative and they might say things like, you know, I think they're doing this on purpose just to drive us bananas. Um, and this really talks about, you know, when somebody has challenging behavior, it's not because they don't want to be doing things in a, in a non-challenging way. It's because they're doing the best they can and there may be some skills or information that they don't have yet to allow them to do well. And so it's just a very powerful video around this. I also share this with schools a lot because um, in some cases we may have teachers that are just really ticked off with kids and kind of um, just sharing and, and trying to help people understand the perspective um, that some of the challenging behaviors that might show up are not willful. Um, they're a kid trying to solve a problem that they don't know how to solve yet. And then I also included a link um, for a book called um, Breaking Free of Childhood Anxiety and OCD. Despite, you know, that I work with, uh, you know, and focus on psychosis, I can't tell you how much um, comorbid anxiety is showing up in a lot of the um, folks that we see in our clinic and with parents. And this is a really helpful book, one for helping parents to understand anxiety, understand that experience of their kids and also setting up, um, a, you know, setting up and helping parents learn how to provide support for their kids. And there's two elements of support. The first piece being empathy and understanding around the experience of anxiety. So in like the said um, example, really understanding how uncomfortable it is for said to have these images and these thoughts, while also providing confidence for that person to be able to manage that anxiety in order to do things that are important to them. And some of that, you know, uh, can also include helping parents to start to scale back um, and adjust some of the ways in which they respond uh, and accommodate. And so I included that resource as well, just because I've been sharing that with so many people recently. And that's all I've got for our formal presentation, but I wanted to provide a little bit of time for discussion if we have it. Anyone have additional reflections, thoughts, questions? Or your have, favorite? Um, thank you for the thank you for the presentation and the case discussion. This has been great. Um, one question I have, and and really anyone could answer it, is I think um, one of the things I struggle with when initially um, working with um, young clients and their families is um, how to balance a message of hope, but also convey the seriousness of the illness and the need um, to really be engaged in treatment. Because um, as a psychiatrist, pretty much the first question I get asked is, when can they stop taking this medicine? Um, and so I'm just wondering if anyone has any um, helpful language around how they convey that, that balance of hope, but also let's take this seriously.
I really appreciate that question. And I think that is a real challenge and especially for prescribers. I think you probably get that question more than every, everybody, everyone else on the team will defer to you when they get that question, right? Um, so it's really challenging. Um, I don't know if other folks wanna jump in. I'll, I'll jump in because I asked the question to a <laughs> prescriber. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, for me and my personal experience, I did ask it, when's it going to get better? When are we done with this medication? And um, the MD at the time happened to know that I have a type one diabetic child and kind of plucked me upside the face and said, I don't know, when are you going to take uh, your daughter's insulin away? Maybe this is who your kid is for life. And um, it was pretty direct, but it worked. Obviously, years later, I still remember it. And um, that was a help to start to formulate it as a biological situation that I didn't mess up my kid. Um, this is something that happened just like my other kid got diagnosed with diabetes as a toddler. So um, I would never think to take her insulin pump away. And so in that context, it worked really well. I do use that in my lived experience with people. Like if you had a child diagnosed with leukemia, you wouldn't de deny the medication. So um, it's part of getting the parent to believe and to understand that they didn't do this. And it's that whole mental health world we navigate. But in my situation, that worked really well. Thank you for sharing that, Ross. Curious if other folks have reflections or thoughts. I can, I can chime in here. I'm sitting here, this is a very pertinent meeting for me and so I've just been taking it all in. I have maybe three cases right now where the families are really heavily involved in various ways um, and you know kind of uh, there are challenges because of that and so I do have one um, young woman whose parents really want her off the medication like just nope we prefer no, and we'd prefer an anxiety medication, which is interesting, Michelle, you're talking so much about anxiety, um, to the antipsychotic medication. And this is a young woman who's been stable for maybe a month. Um, and her parents are like, you know, chop, chop. Um, and really, you know, pushing to have her on just one medication. And in our last, I'm in the medication meetings at our program, I'm a clinician, but I'm in the medication meetings with the prescriber, with the families, with the clients. and. Um, you know, I, I just decided to be really curious. I was like, what would it mean to you guys if, if she were on two medications? Like what mean, what does that mean to you? Um, and so, you know, you get, I got a bit more to the bottom of, um, you know, their belief in more kind of holistic approaches. The father had addiction issues. Um, and so just kind of starting to parse things out, but also being, you know, I'll be pretty direct with people and I'll just say, listen, I understand this is scary. These meds are heavy duty. The side effects sound horrible. Um, and, you know, we, this is our specialty and we've seen lots of, you know, people come through and we know the research and um, we want to support you in making the decisions that are best for you. But these are the things that we, we know and believe to be true. And, um, you know, we really, you know, we'll support you in, in these decisions, but here are the things that could happen. So also providing like what might happen if the person comes off the medication and we don't get to, you know, it doesn't go well. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there's just, um, it, this is just such an important thing. Family work is some of my favorite work to do and some of the hardest work because you have that many clients in the room. Every single person in the room, you're working with their own individual experience and the love and, and sort of highlighting the care that's in the room and that kind of stuff. Um, I know this is because you love her, or, you know, what have you, um, but it is super hard that's one case and that was the case where the family actually started reducing her medication on their own like they were just like less is more like let's you know we'd like to do this a bit faster like, oh my god <laughs> um and these are very bright people these are people who you know are very accomplished people in this world and you know the consistent psychoeducation can like consistent um, over time has really been important. And so, um, you know, that's one case. And then we've got um, a mom who's literally throwing medication in the trash, like it gets prescribed and it goes into the trash can. So that's my next 
That's so next Anne, week. thank um, you for sharing those yeah. experiences. And I love that um, phrase. I just got really curious and I learned <laughs> more about their perspective. And I think that's so incredibly important because understanding the why behind I want my medicine, my, my, you know, child off medicine is incredible. You know, that's going to, that's going to be the key to understanding how to work with that family in staying on the medicine that they need. I had another um, person I worked with years ago that, you know, there was family uh, in another country, like extended relatives that were saying, when are you going to get your kid off that medicine? And so it was the extended relatives that were kind of behind that. I'm realizing it's 1230 and we need to end. Just want to give a big round of applause for all of you for yes. these wonderful questions and participation. And we will be um, putting this up in the, the chat uh, or we'll be, you know, uh, sending the recording. It'll be up on the MHTTC website in a couple of days. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for participating and having this discussion with us. We really, really enjoyed it and learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.